This is Basalon Podcast, the podcast that takes you on thrilling adventures in the world of cycling, ultra cycling, and bikepacking. I'm your host, Sherry. Today's episode is brought to you by Basalon Coffee. If you are someone looking for performance and you don't want to miss on these precious watts, don't miss this episode because joining us today is Art Kessel, the founder of Kogel Bearings. Welcome to the show, Art. Thank you, Sherry. Very excited to be here. Yeah, really excited uh, to have you in the show. I'm wondering, Art, uh, I know you are from the Netherlands. I'm living in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, and uh, you are living now in Colombia. I wonder, how did you end up there? It's because of this best cycling scene, I think. <laughs> it, it's, uh, we, we, we did a, a sort of a job swap, but for, for locations, you and I. So <laughs> I'm very curious to hear how you ended up from the beautiful coffee country, Colombia, in, in rainy, rainy Amsterdam. <laughs> yes, indeed, it rains a lot here. <laughs> yes, so my, um, my wife is, is from Chicago and she works for the, the US State Department. She's a, she's a diplomat. Mm -hmm. So every, every three years she tells me where I will be living and then I say usually something stupid as, is that a city or a country? Um, <laughs> So we've lived in, in, in Mexico, uh, we spent a lot of years living in Washington DC and in Germany and since one year we are in Bogota. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, I'm a trophy husband. <laughs> and how are you finding cycling in Colombia? Are you used to now the altitude there? I think it's like cycling paradise maybe coming from the Netherlands, there's not much mountains here. <laughs> exactly, no, it's... Um, it is it, the, the the altitude. I don't think you can ever get used to it. Uh, Bogota is at 9,200 feet or 20, mm -hmm. 27, 2,800 mm -hmm. meters, and that's just the city level. Like from there, everything goes like. Bruh. <laughs> so, <laughs> I I did not expect when I moved there how many cyclists there are and and how much people are invested in in cycling culture. Mm -hmm. Like my um, from our apartment, we live two blocks from a three-story high billboard of Rio Beta Uran. Oh, wow. <laughs> you wake up with his face. <laughs> oh, I, I, I have to go on a little bit of a walk. <laughs> I don't need to be that close, but that, that is something that even in a, in a super cycling-centered country like uh, the Netherlands, or I lived in Belgium for a long time, like you wouldn't even, you would, even there you would not see that, and you come to Colombia. And mm -hmm. people are so much invested. There's um, a climb just right out, outside my house, which is my, my morning workout. It's like a six and a half kilometer climb and probably goes up about 400, 450 meters. So mm -hmm. that's, I'm very short on time usually. So I, if I find an hour in the morning, that's a perfect, perfect workout. But the amount of cyclists, the, the, the road is basically like a, a two lane highway with no shoulder. And if you ride there on a Saturday or a Sunday morning at eight, nine o'clock, like the cars stay away. Like cyclists are like four deep. You get to the top, it's like a, like a festival. There's like probably a thousand people standing there with their bikes. So that is really incredible to see. Yes, indeed. When I visited Bogota last year, I was surprised of the cycling culture and also the infrastructure. I think there has been a change because cycling is getting popular there. You can see it like a, more people out on the bikes, not only like cyclists, just like people who just enjoy a weekend ride, let's say, or commuters. Yes, mm -hmm. the, the city every Sunday closes down uh, 80 kilometers of roads inside the city just for cyclists. So they wow. shut down the roads for cars and, and there are thousands and thousands of people out there. So it's, yeah, it's not, not a place to go training because there's so much traffic from, from cyclists and runners and people on scooters, but it's a beautiful way to, to go see the city. Yeah, indeed. And I'm curious, talking about Belgium, you used to have your own bicycle shop in uh, Belgium and then there is where, like, kind of you start thinking about the concept of uh, what it became, uh, Kogel Bearings. I'm curious to hear the story. I don't know, I, it's such an innovative product that I'm wondering how, how it began. Yeah, so I moved to Belgium for, for work. And that's where I met my wife. She was doing a master's program at the university. And um, after I, I worked in, in fashion, I was a, a product developer for, for Lee Jeans. Yeah. And after 
doing that for almost 10 years, I, I just had my, my moment of reaching, reaching the limit. I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm, I'm getting out of here. I'm starting a bike shop. Yeah. So that was a, a big step because, you know, cycling is religion in Belgium, especially about ra around racing bikes. Mm -hmm. So uh, for a Dutch person to start a bike shop in Antwerp, in the heart of <laughs> Flanders, was a little bit of a wild decision. Mm -hmm. Also, as you probably know from the Netherlands, there are very few bike shops that, that focus just on, on racing bikes. Like I, I yeah. tried to have a small boutique store. And I did not want any, any commuter bikes in the shop. I, I, mm -hmm. I'm not good at working on them. I, I like working on, on road bikes and mountain bikes. And then somebody would come in for a flat repair on a city bike with like fenders and it would take me hours and hours just to fix a flat. It's like, it, it, it doesn't work for me. So yeah. there was at the time, the only store in, in all of Belgium that, or not in, in all of Antwerp that focused exclusively on, on sports bikes. Oh, wow. So that was really cool. I started it from, uh, from home, just building up a clientele, then moved to a retail location. Mm -hmm. And two years into this fantastic project and me living living my best life my wife was like hey i got a job at the state department i'm moving to america do you want to come <laughs> things you so, do for love right <laughs> I, I, the one love of my life or the other one i had to choose <laughs> so by this time i also found out that working in retail is really really hard work the yes. days for me usually we're like wake up at six open the laptop while still sitting in my bed and then go to the store and then work until like eight, nine, ten o'clock until my wife was on the phone asking, are you still coming home? Repeat tomorrow. <laughs> so after, after doing that for three years, I was like, wow, this is, <laughs> this is hard work. Uh, I, I was ready for a, for a change. I ticked that box in my life. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, we moved to America and I needed a new project. Mm -hmm. And my, uh, my, my biggest frustration as a bike mechanic in Belgium was ball bearings. Because yeah. I, I was selling these super high-end bikes and, and I had customers coming in for, for service. And what always happened is people ride in the rain. They ride on wet roads. It's not good for your bike, but, you know, it's Belgium. Like, Belgium. On Sunday, so, so on Sunday you don't check the forecast to see if it's going to rain. It's like, which, which, which jacket should I bring? That's, that's basically why you look at the forecast. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, what happened a lot was that people would take their bikes out and they would ride them for two, three months and they would bring them back to me and the, everything was rusted out on the wheels, on the bottom bracket. All the bearings were just trashed. And that was always my fault. It was never, it was always the mechanic that did it wrong. It was never the guy at Specialized or a Giant or Pinarello that said, we have a $9,000 bike, let's put 50 cent bearings in them. <laughs> So yeah. that was my big frustration. I, I started when I had the shop looking into like a higher quality, better product that, that would fit that, that top end racing bike. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where, where Kogel was born. When we moved to America, I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to solve my own problem. <laughs> I can relate to that. Huh? Sometimes you're dreaming about the perfect product and you cannot find it. Like, but why? Nobody created that. So then you have to do it yourself. That's my that's my Shark Tank story. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. And as you mentioned, like uh, your products I use, but a lot of people racing. I know you work with pro teams, also world champions and ultra cyclists uh, like Ulrich. I wonder how different are the demands from these athletes or is there any common denominator that they are looking for in their equipment? There are there are things that overlap between everybody and then depending on the discipline that people are in they are you know the the, the execution of it is different so mm -hmm. the ball bearings that we send out to everybody are the exact same we just have the options to put seals on it for lowest friction or yeah. we can put seals on them for best protection yeah and that's something that that wasn't available when i started kogel I was like mountain bikes and road bikes the environment they go into is so different yeah. that, you know, they need a different product. So a mountain biker is willing to give up a few watts of friction in order to, you know, have their bearings run the same at the end of the race and, and as they did at the beginning when it's wet. Mm -hmm. 
where road cyclists are, you know, they, they just want to go, everybody wants to go faster with less energy. That's, that's just what, <laughs> what cyclists are obsessed with. The, yeah, the execution of that for a road cyclist is, is completely different from a mountain biker. And that is the sort of tolerance that we can play with with our athletes. Mm -hmm. And funny enough, what our top level athletes do is very often the opposite of what we recommend for, you know, yeah. mere, mere mortals like, like you and I. <laughs> yeah. So we have, for instance, uh, the, the first uh, big road cycling team that we sponsored. They mm -hmm. wanted um, like the best, they wanted, we, we call it our cross seals, so that the, the off-road seals for, for best protection, we call them cross seals. They wanted to have that on all their bottom brackets, mm -hmm. not obviously not to go faster, but it was to save time for the mechanics at stage races. Yeah. Like there's two or three mechanics and they have to, every day in stage racing, they have to clean 16 bikes at the minimum. Because, well, there's eight riders, there's eight spares, and usually there's, like, you know, a second car with more spares on it. Yeah. So in, in order for the mechanics not to be working until three in the morning, because they have to get up in the morning to, to, to get the, the bikes ready for the next race day, they, they chose that as a little bit of a protection for, for the mechanics. Yeah. So this is our first big road team, the United Healthcare team um, in the U.S. They were using our off-road bearings for road cycling. Mm -hmm. And if I look at our downhill racers, like Aaron Gwynn and Dag Norton, they do the exact opposite. They ride mountain bikes, but the races are three minutes. So there's nothing you can do to break a bearing in three minutes. <laughs> yes. So the races are won by hundreds of a second. So the guys are obsessed with friction. So they run road bearings on, on their mountain bikes, regardless of the condition. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we can do that is because the top level downhillers, they have a personal mechanic like x each bike has its own mechanic yeah and if you talk to aaron Gwynn's mechanic uh john hall he literally says this is my bike aaron gets to ride it and that's how it goes like the bike is always with john and then it goes away with aaron to go ride for an hour and it goes back to the mechanic and he strips the whole thing and gets it ready for the next race day or the next practice session yeah so if oh, bikes get that much attention, I have no problem like taking away the the the, the, sa the safety buffer. Mm -hmm. Indeed, I think it's very important, as you mentioned, durability in different uh, weather conditions. I noticed that during uh, my transcontinental race, I was like, it's such a toll on the equipment, and you have to cross continents, and there's rain, gravel, rocks, all sorts of things. It can go from like a minus temperatures then to up to like 39 degrees. So all of these changes in weather conditions put a huge strain on your parts. And actually, I've been finding myself doing the same, switching from road parts to more off-road equipment or gravel, <laughs> gravel specific work on my road bike because of that of durability and weather protection. Yeah, uh, for for ultra racing, there is the fact of if this breaks I am out in the middle of nowhere and uh, Europe is a little bit better but out in the middle of nowhere in the US also means you have no cell reception there's no calling calling somebody for backup because your phone doesn't work here mm -hmm. so yeah you have to build in a buffer and, and uh, adapt to what what is required by your environments Indeed, and I find uh, sometimes people underestimate the marginal gains you can get with your drivetrain, just improving this part, because uh, you think, oh, only the fast guy, it matters one or two watts, it doesn't matter for me. Yeah, you don't go as fast, but you go <laughs> like at 10 times the distance. So when you have equipment that is really good and it's really durable and really it makes a difference, I sometimes... Uh, uh, was in races and I was like, oh my god, I should have bought this other thing instead of this cheap one because it was like, a, then you're stuck so in the middle of nowhere and you're like, oh, what do I do now? I wish I would have bought this, you know? So I think, uh, I think uh, for sometimes for ultra cycling, you really have to um, kind of obsess about the single details because this little detail will hunt you for 4,000 kilometers <laughs> so absolutely no the the, the planning exp aspect and i've never been an ultra cyclist uh when i when i when i raced bicycles that was about 20 kilos ago when my face looked more like that i i raced a mountain bike marathon mm -hmm. so i'm used to being out on on the bike for six seven eight hours but i cannot imagine how it is to, to be in a race that just goes for 
10 days straight. Indeed. <laughs> the planning aspect of, of that is, is just off the chart. So yeah. anyone who, who can do a race like Transcontinental or the, um, yeah, any, any of the ultra distances, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, I remember seeing some pictures of one of your athletes, uh, Ulrich, uh, after Tour de I was like, wow, <laughs> the equipment can survive Tour de Bite and survives everything. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, I've seen pictures of his rear tire that he rode from, from Mexico, or from, from Canada to Mexico, and the tire was just done with red sticking out of it, and he was still riding it, so that was that was really cool. Yeah, exactly. And I think uh, sometimes like uh, those savings, like um, I remember like I started investing more on my drive train, also like uh, more products like uh, specific like walks versus loop, etc. And at the end of uh, Transcontinental, I was blown away. My chain still has, is, is still perfect after 4,000 kilometers. That's not supposed to be the lifespan of a chain in rain, dust and everything. And then it, because everything I did, every single detail I switch is like, paid off. It was running like a perfectly smooth for 4,000 kilometers. So I was like, whoa, pace off, pace off. <laughs> so how did you do that during the race? What did you do? You, you waxed the chain before you left? And then how, how did you maintain it through the, throughout the race? Just a little bottle to top it off every yeah. day or a couple of days? Yeah, exactly. So what I did, I used a graphene loop at the beginning because it's very sticky. So even in wet condition, it stays on the chain. It's, it's not easy to apply, I must say. <laughs> but uh, yeah, for one time use, so you just uh, bait it into graphene loop and then you can use like I used the, um, the silica weld loop to top up. And that was amazing. Like kept the dry train like uh, running super smooth. And uh, with the cogel bearings, I also the oversized derailleur cage I found was easier to clean also because of the size of the bearing so you can just take a towel and easily clean and it was like running super smooth but when the small uh over uh, the small pulley wheels get dirty it's like you don't know how to clean that especially not in a race you're not gonna take the time so you need something that is easy to do easy to access so i found that uh, the small things made a difference especially in such a conditions we had like uh three four days of storm in the alps I know that is that is not good for mental health. <laughs> not indeed. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So every world uh, matters. I will say, <laughs> no matter uh, the event. Yeah. So you mentioned you did some uh, racing back uh, back in the Netherlands. Yes. Uh, when I when I lived in the Netherlands, I I raced mountain bikes and and well as you. As you know, Netherlands is not great for mountain biking because, you know, it, it's missing the mountain, the mountain part. So most of my races were in Belgium, in the Ardennes, and then uh, in, in Germany, we, we traveled quite a bit. And there was a, a race series at the time that, that actually hit, it, it was organized by Dutch people, but it was hitting all the races around in, in say, four hours drive from the Netherlands. So, uh, yeah, that, that's it. I... Uh, I, I usually enjoyed the 70 kilometer distance more than the 100 kilometer because it's nice to just go sit on the bike and hammer for three, four hours and, and go back to the showers mm -hmm. instead of being being on the bike for eight hours suffering. But I just, I just realized I'm barking up the wrong tree. Eight hours is easy for you. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say like for me, like... <laughs> It's like, you know, it's like the wall, but I'm really like, uh, it's funny, everybody expects me to be fast and then I go on a ride and I go very slow. It's like that lady <laughs> crosses continent. It's like, no, it's because like I like to have a slow, steady pace for a long time. So, and uh, but sometimes like, you know, different style of riders like prefer like, okay, more intensity, really uh, leave out everything on the road. So I think it's a different style of riding and that's why I love cycling. There's so many, you know, you can be all type of cyclists you want you, and there's so much to learn. Yeah, indeed. And I wonder, uh, you've been in the bike industry for quite a while, not? Kogel started in 2013, right? Yes. In January yeah. of 2014, we did the, the first sale. So in, in the year leading up to that, I was already planning and working on it. But yeah, officially 2014. So uh, I wonder, as you had also your own bicycle store, do you see like the bike industry has changed a lot since you started? For example, all these problems that uh, you might have seen in your own shop or in the in terms of equipment that is 
maybe like the bikes that is making a real difference in performance these days. Yes, I think uh, the, the the way that bicycles develop, you see that I think most on on mountain bikes, the bikes that I was riding with 26 inch wheels and and even rim brakes as a, as mountain bikes riding across the Alps, are nothing compared to the to the 29er bikes with slack geometry that that we have now. It's it's uh, yeah over 10 years. It's it's a world of difference. Mm -hmm. When um, my my first racing bikes had three chain rings. And now that went to two, and now there's only one, and with a with, with a cassette that's bigger than than the chain ring. That's <laughs> so. That, those, those are things that have definitely changed over the years. Um, on road bikes, when I sold my shop, was the DA2, the electronic shifting, was something that j was just coming up, and mm -hmm. I think even that has come su such a long way. In the first editions you would have a, a battery that was bolted to your chainstay and now all that stuff is nicely hidden inside the frame so we still see developments and uh, yeah it's all for the good yeah indeed uh, on that point I'm curious what do you think one buy or two buy <laughs> I'm, I'm considering switching to one buy <laughs> I, I think on gravel bikes it makes sense on road bikes I don't know if the technology is there we, we mm -hmm. expect road bikes to have very small gear steps so in order to achieve that, you either need to go to, you know, having 14, 15 gears, or you need to have a way to have a smaller cassette and, and be able to shift in the front. Yeah, I've seen uh, some in the world tour, like now some pro teams are switching to Mumbai, I was like, oh, road. <laughs> but they, sp they do that for specific stages. That it's mm -hmm. not, it's throughout the Tour de France, they maybe pick one or two stages where, 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 where the front derailleur is not needed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, it's um, it's uh, it's for gravel bikes. I think the simplicity for for if, when you're way out in the outback, having a one by system is just one less part on your bike that can break. So only for that reason, it would already be you know very useful for for the kind of riding that you do to have just simplicity and a, and a single ring setup. Yeah, and uh, what do you think about combining it, for example, uh, with the Kogel Colossus oversized derailleur cage? I think that is the best thing since warm water. <laughs> 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 um, yes, it's it's one of those things where, where people tell you it doesn't work until they try it. Mm -hmm. And that's the same with ceramic bearings for if you... you Google do ceramic bearings work on my bike for every person that says it's fantastic you will find another person that says oh that doesn't work for bicycles mm -hmm. yeah it sometimes can be like uh, one of these uh, controversial topics like walks versus loop <laughs> things like that yeah I personally love it uh, like uh, I mean when I saw the the pulley wheels spinning after 4,000 kilometers smoothly I was like okay no, now, <laughs> now you know <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and for example, I've seen like you brought now like uh, the same oversized derailleur cage, but uh, an aero version. So how how did it uh, come about? I think uh, that's great uh, for people obsessed with aerodynamics like me living in the Netherlands. You sh you might know the Dutch mountains. <laughs> the Dutch mountains is just a strong headwind. Yeah. So the aero cage started as as a fun project it was never supposed to be a, a product oh, okay. we, um are, are you familiar with with danger home the 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 bike builder on on instagram ah uh, no I, I should check it out so here's a here's a, a free shout out uh, danger home is a, a swedish former bike mechanic and uh he builds these over the top custom bikes like it goes to any any detail he will uh, make like cut open uh, like electronic shifters and then then build his own and and try to integrate everything so there's no cables visible at all on a mountain bike and uh, he worked with with Google we had a couple of projects uh, that he was working on and one of them was that he was building an, an aero road bike and it was the first time he built a road bike and I was like, okay, well, we can put another Colossus. We already made things like yeah, we have our customizer on the website so people can choose colors what they want. Like the next level that we can do is, is cover the, the uh, coat the uh, Colossus with, with Cerakote, which mm -hmm. is like a super hard ceramic uh, coating. I want to say it's paint, but that is 
like a, a disservice to, to Sarah code. It's, <laughs> it looks like paint, but it's, it's, it's way better. Mm -hmm. So we've done that. And at one point he was like, oh, I'm building this super aerodynamic bike with like six spoke wheels. And I was like, well, we, we got to do something special for this bike. So we designed just for the heck of it, an aerodynamic cage. Um, oh, wow. I still have the, the very first prototype here. Oh, so wow. my camera is a, is a little funky. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, that looks amazing. I was like, we need to do something because this bike is going to attract probably half a million eyeballs on, on, on Instagram and on YouTube. So we need to do something special. Yeah. We designed this cage. He built the bike with a one by setup. So even though it's a road bike, he had a SRAM Explore derailleur on it and, and a single front ring. Yeah. So we designed our cage around that. We mm -hmm. took it to Sea Otter Classic, the biggest uh, bike expo in, in, um, in the US. And the response that we got on, on just having the prototypes there, where I was like, oh, we're not going to make that. It's like, it's just, it was just for the heck of it. Uh, <laughs> The response that we got there was like, wow, there, there's a market for this. We, we need to release this as a product. Yeah. Problem was, we designed this just to be a one-off for, for this one bicycle that was running with an Explore derailleur. So here we are. We have an aerodynamic cage that only fits on gravel bikes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so from there, we had to go back to the drawing board and, and just redesign the cage for, to fit on, on Shimano, on Dura A's, and on Tegra, and on the... SRAM Red and Force uh, two by derailers. Yeah. So that that a that took a little while. Mm -hmm. Also, the first plan was for these cages to be three D printed. This 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 product is all from a three D printer, mm -hmm. and it came yeah. out. Well, I can only show it quickly to you, otherwise you see how bad it is. I can <laughs> well, I, can, I, I can show you. We're friends now. Yeah. Look at this. Look at the yeah, gap yeah, in yeah. between there. The parts yeah. don't even fit together. The yeah, yeah, the pillars see. that the pulleys sit on, they, they don't even fit a pulley, so this was the... <laughs> but our manufacturer that made this in 3D printing realized that, and as soon as they sent us the first samples, they made the exact same case already from a CNC machine, mm, and, that, and yeah. that was a perfect fit. So that file that we sent in was never supposed to be for, for machining, but they managed to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, yeah. It's a, oh, it's a very exciting project to, uh, to work on. I can tell you, I'm, I'm with this guy. I was thinking about the same. I just bought five spoke wheels <laughs> for my gravel bike. I, uh, and I wanted to go with the, change my road bike to one bike with the Explore cassette. <laughs> so I can tell you, and I was like, I saw the oversized derailleur cage with the aero cover. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so I can tell you there's more people like him. I was like, you were describing his bike. I was like, that's exactly what I wanted to do. So we, we might still have a prototype sitting somewhere. Let me let me know when you built that bike and I'll I'll start digging. We we only had four cages. Uh, I know one oh, is with wow. Gustav and one is probably with our photographer. I'll I'll, I'll dig yeah. it out. I'll I'll take care yeah. of you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think it's uh, super nice to see all this innovation also with the 3D printed one. I also designed my own plate for the aero bars because you couldn't angle them. So also like 3D printed with CNC. It's so nice that now you can go on these all detailed products that you couldn't get before. And uh, really, like uh, for me, Kogel is a brand that drives innovation. Well, Definitely. fantastic. I always like to think that we're a little bit conservative compared to, to other companies that, that are constantly pushing the boundaries. I, I always like to sit back and, and wait a little. If something revolutionary comes out, you can be the first to market, which is great. Mm -hmm. Personally, I like to sit back a little, let, let people figure it out, see what works well, what doesn't. And then, you know, in six months we, we have an idea and then we can come out with, with something that maybe works a little bit better than, than somebody's uh, V1 of, of any product. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, thank you very much, Art, uh, for uh, joining us today in the show. I'm looking forward to see uh, the new products uh, from Kogel. And uh, yeah, so nice to have you in the show. Fantastic. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me.